Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Moreno. KRWG is collaborating with the League of Women Voters in Las Cruces to present a series on changes and issues facing public education in the state of New Mexico. We've also been coordinating with the Las Cruces Public Schools to see firsthand how these changes at the national and state level are making an impact right here in the Mesilla Valley. Today we discuss virtual learning and here to share with us a little bit more about virtual learning is Dr. Marcy Oxford. Dr. Oxford is coordinator of virtual learning with the Las Cruces Public Schools. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now I'd like to learn a little bit more about the Virtual Learning Academy here in Las Cruces. Could you share this a little bit about how long it's been in existence and what it is really? Sure. Um, the Virtual Learning Academy has been in existence. This is our third year and we're really a program in Las Cruces public schools. We serve students from all, all high schools, most of the middle schools. I even have some students in elementary school who take online classes. Now an online class is um, it's one in which there is a real teacher on the other end of, of a virtual classroom. So to differentiate between that and, and just a, a program where a student would, would access materials online. There is a real teacher on the other end. So there's a difference. Um, th it, many, some students are going through this program, they're dealing with a real teacher. Exactly. There is a real certified teacher um, who interacts with them on a regular basis, um, grades their work, gives them feedback, communicates with them um, whenever they need to. When you say regular basis, what is that? Um, so there is uh, an expectation that if a student has a question, um, they, can, they will get an answer from their teacher within 24 hours. There's also a possibility of phone calls, uh, Skype calls. Uh, we even have some students who actually come to our teachers or teachers go to them when issues come up, when, when a face-to-face -face is necessary. So. Um, regular basis I mean when needed so they're they're interacting with them certainly every day as they turn turn work in and they get it graded but face-to-face um, uh, -face communication or phone call when needed what's the difference between you know a, a virtual learning environment um, through the Academy and a traditional learning Academy I guess you know I mean they're checking in now now every now and then or is it a full course load or how, how does the schedule work? So most of our kids are um, just taking one or two classes at a time. So they're in a regular schedule at a high school or middle school and they just have one period of their day, one or two periods of their day in which they are working on their online class. Um, I do have a few students who are fully online. Um, that that's just a, a, per, a small percentage. Most of our students, as I said, um, have a regular schedule at school, and for whatever reason, they they need this online class, and they um, best case fit it in within their day. Some of them are doing it though outside of their school day. Tell me a little bit about the students that are looking to be in the virtual academy. What type of students are you doing? Uh, we, they run the gamut. We've got students who are, are taking an online class because they, um, they can't fit enough, say, AP or advanced classes within their day, a schedule conflict. And so they, they just want more, more, more acceleration. Um, we've got students who, um, for uh, other examples of scheduling conflict, would be they um, there's only one section of physics, say, taught at a high school, and it falls right when that student wants to take band or choir or something else. So instead of having them choose between the two classes, they can take it online, and then they, they get to take both. We've got students who, um, 
who are um, needing the class um, because they are um, needing a credit recovery and so they or, or maybe they have to work and they want to take it um, instead of um, coming to school full day, so they take it online. So as far as these different schedules go, you could have students at different high schools and you could also have possibly students that are just strictly at home the whole time due to varying circumstances? Right. We've got some students at home. Some are choosing to be homeschooled and so they can take advantage of the online. We've got students who are homebound for one reason or another, um, illness, um, who just can't make it to school or make it through a full day of school, but they can, they can work from home and um, that's really helpful for some students. I've got Right now I have a student who is um, on sabbatical with her mother in Mexico City and so I've had, I've had several instances where kids have gone to other countries with their parents and instead of um, just missing the semester of credits they, they are able to keep up and then just come right back to school and, and take off where they left when they left with their parents. So that's, those are some of my, my favorite situations. Um, Why is that? Oh, just because it's it's great for the kids. You know, we, we who doesn't want their child to go on sabbatical to Sweden or Denmark or or we've had them in France, Germany. Um, but but this way if they they can come back to school and graduate on time and not skip a beat. So it's a real win win situation for those families. Who's eligible to be in this academy? Um, any Las Cruces Public Schools student is, is technically eligible. Not every student is going to thrive in an online environment. So um, we are... Well, how do you measure that? How do you know when a student well, isn't going you, to thrive? I mean, d right. is there signs or um, past performance? Or? Past performance. Um, to, be a, to be a successful online student, you've got to be a pretty independent, self-motivated learner. Um, just because, you know, in a, in a regular classroom I can look at you and tell that you, you don't understand something or that you need to get busy and walk over and, and help you along with that. In an online situation it's, it's a less um, obvious and so students really need some, some extra support. Um, uh, you know, students obviously need to be able to read proficiently to be successful online because um, although some of the content is video or, or um, picture based, most a lot of it is just text. So um, a proficient level of reading is really important to have. Um, so currently uh, most of the students that are or all that are in right now are pretty strong self-motivated uh, students. Well, no. Okay. <laughs> Some of them aren't, and that's why we um, we we recommend that the first time a student takes an online class, um, they take it in what we call a uh, a learning lab and with a learning coach. And this is um, a situation at school during the day where there is a coach who can um, help the student learn how to be a self-motivated, independent learner children aren't born knowing how to do that and so some of them take a little bit more time to get the hang of it. So this, um, this adult is, uh, this person is just a caring adult who can help the, keep the kid on pace, um, help the student stay um, focused. If the student has trouble with some content, the, the learning coach's job is to help them learn how to advocate for themselves, ask those questions, um, find resources to make them more successful. Uh, one of the resources that you, the district has is also, I guess, the computer lab where students right. can right. stop by <coughs> and get some help. Um, absolutely. Every, every, um, every one of our high schools and middle schools has a a computer lab where students are scheduled into where this learning coach is responsible for for making sure that they're successful. So um, our state has a graduation requirement whereby 
a student has to have either an AP or honors class, a dual credit class, or a distance class. So if a student chooses not to take dual credit or isn't, uh, isn't interested in AP or honors, then they've, they've got to take this distance learning class, this online class. And so that is um, often the student who is scheduled into those learning labs to, to get help. Is speaking of requirements with the state and maybe the federal level, is there any differences between the virtual academy and a traditional classroom? Um, as far as curriculum and expectations, no. There, the um, our classes are fully aligned with the with the standards that are found in in a face-to-face -face classroom. This is something I'm kind of curious about. I mean. As a, you know, I, as someone who has taken online courses in college, um, I was also curious in high school, um, how can you validate that the student's work is authentic? Is theirs? Yes. Um, that's a good question. Um, first of all, all of our, all of our um, finals are required to be proctored. So we know at least that the final exam is taken by the student. Um, and you'd be surprised how quickly an e-teacher can, um, can figure out that a student is, is not doing his or her own work. The learning coach also is there to help support that. So is, it, is, it a, is, it, is a student able to cheat in an online class and have their brother or their uncle do the work for them? Yes, but that's, there's no difference in that and a, and a traditional class. So um, you, uh, the teacher is just, um, we work hard to get to know our students and just to communicate with those learning coaches and the counselors to make sure that, that the work that is being turned in is, does belong to the student. And then again, the, um, the final is a good, you know, it's worth 20% of the, of the course grade. And so um, that's often very telling. Okay. Well, it's very interesting learning about this and I, you know, as this type of learning grows, I mean, it seems like it is in some ways as we're um, becoming more of a virtual world. Right. It seems like something that, um, is this like the beginning of it? I mean, it's just really just starting to take off? Um, it is starting to take off nationally, internationally. Um, virtual learning is really, really um, growing by leaps and bounds. Um, some predict that a huge percentage of, of learning will be done online very, very soon. Um, I don't believe that, that the place of a face-to-face of -face teacher will ever be completely taken over by online, um, but it, it certainly is a nice option in some, in some circumstances. It's, a, it's, it's very beneficial to expand opportunities um, for different students to to finish their their school. Well, I, I want to thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us a little bit of, about this. And I look forward to speaking with you in the future as we Great. continue this series. Okay, super. Thanks, thank Anthony. You. Thank you. Our guest was Dr. Marcy Oxford. She is coordinator of virtual learning with the Las Cruces Public Schools. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our next guest is Josh Silver, Dean of Students at Arrowhead Park Early College High School. Mr. Silver was a teacher for 10 years in the Las Cruces Public Schools, and he was also the 2014 Teacher of the Year. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, I appreciate that. I want to say congratulations too, by the way. Thank you, that means a lot, I appreciate that. So how is the transition going from teacher to administrator? It's an interesting transition. It's been enjoyable. I, I really enjoy just getting to work with students in a different capacity, it's fun. There are some days I miss working in the classroom, but, but the more I spend in this deanship position, the more I, I really appreciate the work that administrators are doing and appreciate the, the role that I get to play in their success. So I really enjoy that. Well, share with us a little bit about your role mm -hmm. as Dean of Students. Uh, what do you do? So I'm the Dean of Students at Arrowhead Park Early College High School, and much of that work is, is connected directly to student success. So my principal always tells me that my job is to advocate for the best interest of every student at the school. Um, so I'm not there in any sort of mental health capacity at all. I'm really there for academic advising. 
uh, and I'm there to work on sort of helping students reach those academic goals, ensuring success, uh, intervening when that success isn't, isn't there at the level that we think it should be. Um, I work a lot with like our higher education institutions um, on that, the dual credit piece of our school and on that alignment and that, you know, just all of the issues that sort of arise with, with dual credit and, and helping students make that successful transition to higher education. I see. So, you I mean, you're dealing with students with many different academic goals, I don't know. Yes, sir, absolutely. What could you share with us? Like, I mean, there's such a wide range. Uh, yeah, know. well, right now we're looking, I was looking at this morning at our sort of the senior class profile. We have 101 seniors graduating, and they range everywhere from um, like very much interested in heading into, into medical fields, like surgeon, um, down to EMT work, uh, criminal justice. We have students who are interested in, in law enforcement, uh, a couple in military. Uh, culinary arts, um, sort of, they just run the gamut. Engineering, uh, we have quite a few students interested in engineering work um, all over the place, right? Like, it, you're right, it's absolutely, there's students that are, the education, I was just, I was talking to a student this morning about a scholarship that's been released specifically for education students, so. I see. They're all over the place, absolutely. Yeah, it just seems interesting you have students that are probably pretty focused, have their next five years of academic life to 10. Planned out. We do, and we have some that have no sort of plan for the future, and it's it's great to work with both, right? Like, I can totally appreciate being 17 and 18 and not having any idea what comes next, and so it's nice to be able to help them navigate some of these systems in grade 12 and then heading heading into whatever comes next for them, um, whether that's the workforce or whether that's college. It's nice to be able to help them navigate those systems. I was able to spend some time at Arrowhead Park, and mm -hmm. um, it's students there are leaving with a college education halfway complete. Yes, sir. They are. They're finishing with uh, their, the, most of them, they're finishing with their associate's degrees. And the majority of our students are finishing with their associates in, what we call the Associate of Arts or the Associate of Science programs through DACC. Um, there are some that are leaving with workforce certifications, like in welding or uh, like HVAC, things like that. They would be leaving, heading into the workforce. The majority of our students, though, are heading into, um, are, are looking at, you know, four-year institutions after graduation. Okay. Well, we've been talking about uh, virtual learning, mm -hmm. and I was wondering a little bit about uh, what your experience is with that. Um, I understand that you also uh, have some experience teaching virtual learning. Yeah, so within Las Cruz Public Schools, um, my, my, I guess, roles, I wear a couple of different hats with virtual learning. Um, through the Dean of Students position at Arrowhead Park, I really am responsible for uh, the scheduling of those distance learning courses. So, um, Dr. Oxford mentioned that there's students that are, they're all placed into learning labs throughout the day. That's part of our, that's part of my work with students is, is scheduling those labs and then filling those labs with students. Um, I'm also the one that finds those schedule conflicts first, usually a student that might want to take this course that conflicts time-wise with this course. And that's especially important with the college catalog, you know, like with the, the college schedule, oh, yeah. that becomes a whole different entity that we're sort of playing with, a lot of moving parts. And so we have students that are taking online courses at Arrowhead Park, early college high school, that I'm the one scheduling them in. Um, I've also worked with Dr. Oxford in the Retro Learning Academy as a e teacher for her for three years now. So I've taught English, this year I'm teaching English 4, so 12th grade English, I have an AP language section, AP language and composition, and then I have two students in a creative writing class this semester. So they're a little spread out, but, um, but it's, it's a fun, they're all like, you know, they all live in the English world. So tell me the difference of, about, you know, teaching to a student in a virtual learning environment compared to a traditional one. The virtual environment's a lot harder. It's, it's a lot harder. You don't have that immediate student feedback. Um, I can't look at a student and know that they're understanding what I'm saying. And so there's, there's, there's a disconnect there that needs to be bridged. And that, bridging that is sometimes a challenge. It's finding how do I connect those students and making sure they feel like they're part of a school community, which is so important to me. Like that's critical in my, my day job at Arrowhead Park. And it's, critical, it's equally critical in my virtual learning work is helping students feel like they are connected to school and connected to a teacher and connected to their colleagues, their classmates. And that's, that's a challenge in an online class. Like it's really, we as the, the teachers need to be very purposeful and strategic in making sure we can create those opportunities for kids. I mean, uh, you, I could see that how it can easily, a student could be disconnected or feel disconnected, yeah. if, especially if they're just taking all of their courses and weren't on a campus anytime. Um, how do you try to bridge 
it, that connection. It, it, it's difficult. So with students that are taking you know one or two courses online and that are they're in those distance learning labs, they're great. That lab may be filled with twenty students all taking different courses. Um, you know, some may be in English, some may be in math, they, some may be in physics, they may be in all sorts of different courses, but at least they're together and they're with a common teacher and it, all being in Las Cruces, it's possible for me as the teacher to go to those classrooms. It's possible, I'm in regular contact with that learning coach in the room. Um, I'm in regular contact with the counselor who's scheduling them. Um, and so there's a network of support for these students, um, which is really helpful. My, the, not being in a classroom every day at Arrowhead Park gives me the chance and a lot more flexibility to, to sort of a, meet kids' needs where they're at throughout the community. Um, I can pick up the phone and call them a lot easier than, than if I was in a classroom every day. Um, so just having that communication with them. I have a student that is, is very, very interested in Skyping on an ongoing basis. Like th this is important to him. Like this is how he feels connected to class. It was very important that early on we, we got a Skype connection there. and. It's, it's important to him feeling connected. So that's what we do, we, we make it work for him. I see, so when you, I mean, you say this network of people working together. I yes, mean, sir. Could kind of describe that a little bit for me. Absolutely, so there's the, there's the teacher on the other side. There's, the, that, uh, that sometimes, you know, we may go a whole semester and never see this student, like face to face. We may never ever see them. Um, there's that learning coach that's in the classroom with them every day. Uh, there's the counselor at the school who's, you know, the counselor at the school that's doing, this in addition to the scheduling, is really doing the, that academic advising piece. Uh, there's their parents, uh, Dr. Oxford, who, you know, oversees uh, virtual learning. All of those people sort of create this network for students and we're all invested in their success. I see. Um, I guess, it, do the subjects have to be different in a way that you reach the students for certain things? I mean, you teach English and yes. um, you know creative writing. So I imagine that you have a different way to learn a little bit about um, you know what the student uh, yeah. is picking up, or you know whether it's through grammar or their uh, work that they're they're doing. Um, how is it different than other subjects in in reaching the student or, or making them understand that they're learning the material? Absolutely. So the creative writing class is probably my favorite to teach. Uh, because it's a creative writing class, right? Like that's where you get to know students' personalities immediately and really understand them. And, and a lot of that's even, you know, I guess to address that, how do we sort of understand the students' needs and really work with them, that's built into the structure of, of these courses um, very specifically. And so in this creative writing class, it really starts with some, you know, pre-writing work and some, give me some work samples, and then we go back to those throughout the semester. So I think you just even structure-wise and curriculum-wise, we're able to address a lot of that. But in a creative writing class, it's also totally, it's fun. Like I get to, th these two students I'm with right now, they both enjoy um, working on screenplays. They have a passion for, for film um, and film history. And, and then they have, you know, like a, a young adolescent sense of adventure to go with that and so it's just it's really an enjoyable process and I really enjoy getting to work with them on that and then my English students it is a little bit different um, they're not always as willing to be there right as in an elective creative writing course uh, but that's okay too like it's it's a it's a chance to sort of understand them and why they're why they're here and and you know I may have students that are traveling internationally right now or you know are working because they they need to work right now or because they're taking a half day of college classes so it's just fun to get to know all of them in their individual situations and and really then finding assignments that give them the opportunity to work with each other uh, which is which is a really powerful experience for all of them you know and something that is pretty new to them they've never really experienced that I mean they've, they've had those experiences in a in a face-to-face -face classroom but um, I, it's pretty unusual and usually a first time experience for them to really have meaningful collaboration in an online class. I see. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your work with uh, blended teaching and how you work with teachers to um, prepare them to become a blended teacher. Could you explain a little bit about what blended teaching is? Absolutely. And how you work with teachers? Yeah, so before I was the Dean of Students at Early College, I worked uh, two years as an English teacher at Arrowhead Park, and then I worked at, a, at Sierra Middle School here in Las Cruces. Um, in that time, my later time at Sierra, and then my time at Early College, I was really working with, with blended learning as the teacher and sort of experimenting with that and understanding what that could look like. Still seeing my students every day, but how do I use this online system to, uh, to enhance their learning and to support their learning and to uh, fill in gaps for their learning? And so that, that was kind of a constant 
experiment for me. It was a lot of working with um, it, with individual students and finding you know ways to offer additional materials to them in class or offer alternative materials to them in class. And, and I would look at that, that blended learning environment as a way to, uh, to really fill those gaps for students. And so that sort of evolved into an opportunity to share that with other teachers in the district. So um, there are blended classrooms all over the West Coast Public School District right now. And, um, and I think one of the, the most powerful opportunities there is just getting all those teachers together and sharing what they're doing. And so I'm often able to facilitate those meetings and sort of share what the, not only what the logistics of a blended learning classroom looks like, like this is how our learning management system works, um, but also to sort of guide that conversation about what does best practice look like for these students and how do we as blended learning teachers, um, you know, maximize the potential here to really help students and, and really think differently about education and how we can meet students' needs. Well, we just have like about a minute left, but I was curious, what are the teachers saying and how they feel that um, students are reacting and how they can maximize their needs in a blended learning environment? Uh, I don't know if I could speak for everybody else, right? But I can say that for me, it's, it's, it's encouraged me to continue to think about what's best for kids, which I think is, is what our job is all about and what I, what I want to continue to do, whether that's in a dean position or in an e-teaching position, or in this case, in both. Okay. Well, uh, Josh, I want to thank you very much for thank stopping you. by and sharing with us. And I imagine I'll be in touch to learn more information Excellent. as we continue this series. Look forward to it. Thank you. Our guest was Josh Silver. He is Dean of Students at the Arrowhead Park Early College High School. I'm Anthony Moreno. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to thank the League of Women Voters in Las Cruces for helping us out and also the Las Cruces Public Schools for making uh, so much of their staff available as we continue this education series. Have a great day.